Let's do it. So um, last time we did our sort of lightning introduction to um, deep learning for manipulation. Uh, we talked a little bit, a little bit more detail about uh, the deep version of pose estimation and some of the nuances of asking a neural network to spit out a, a rot in orientation. You know, and that if you if you choose Euler angles, you might be sad. If you choose quaternions, there's some evidence that you might be sad. And and thinking more about the exact uh, output that you ask the network to, to give um, can make a big difference. And I guess the last big point I made uh, last time was that um, for the types of shapes we often manipulate in manipulation, uh, we have to accept that there's going to be potentially ambiguity in pose. And so outputting an entire distribution over pose can be a much richer specification than asking for just a single pose. But I, I already forecasted. I actually think um, asking for a pose out of the network um, is probably the wrong thing to ask for, okay? It pigeons, pigeonholes you into um, a notion, uh, you know, a world where you have CAD models, for instance, of your objects, and you're trying to find a specific object in the world where, uh, you know, you can describe that object by the CAD model and the pose, for instance. And I want to think today with you about a little bit more general, you know, question of, of object representations, right? And I think, you know, what object representations support manipulation? Okay, and um, it's a subtle thing, but we've sort of already given, we have sort of pipelines that work for two extremes, right? We have, um, you know, at one extreme, we have known objects. Let's say we have a CAD model or something that we can throw in a simulator and generate a bunch of data. Um, you know, we can do pose. We can do our grasp. We could do, you know, pose estimation, grasp planning. We can do, you know, we can specify the goals of manipulation in terms of pose of objects, you know. That's a pretty good pipeline, but its limitation, I think, really comes from having to, to do only known objects. At the other extreme, we said, you know, unknown objects, anything goes, I would say arbitrary unknown objects. And we did, you know, even just geometric um, estimation, you, we did antipodal grasping. And for simple objectives, where you just want to do things like move all of the points in that bin over to that bin, then that's actually a fairly useful pipeline. You'll see, um, you know, if you combine this with uh, a deep segmentation network, even an instance level set segmentation, and recognition, then that gets already pretty useful, right? And we're gonna have you do this on the problem set. Um, <clears throat> you know, you could say like, pick the mustard bottle out of the bin, right? Or pick the cheese it box, or you know, there is a world outside of cheese it boxes and spam cans and, and mustard bottles, but you know, we're pretty happy in our little world. So, um, you know, that is already a pretty good pipeline. But at some point, you know, manipulation is about more than just picking things up and dropping them off. That's not a very rich specification for a task. So what I want to think about with you today is sort of this middle ground of, uh, you know, what, how can we relax the assumption of, of known objects? You know, we're going to have to give up, I think, doing arbitrary unknown objects because I don't even know how to specify, if you just tell me the object is anything, then I don't really even know how to specify the task anymore, right? So I need something in the middle here that is, you know, usefully general, but allows me to still specify the task. And I think what the, um, you know, computer vision world has, has um, been calling it and what we've been starting to call it in manipulation, there's a nice spot, it's probably a little bit closer to the known objects than the 
full arbitrary that I want to explore today, which is this sort of category level. Category level perception and category level manipulation. Okay, and um, I think that the trick is gonna be finding representations of objects that allow us to specify the task, but aren't tied to having just a single, um, you know, a single cat. It doesn't have to be a pose, for instance. Okay, and um, there's a few canonical categories that like all the roboticists like to use, okay? So I, you know, here's the task roughly. I've got mugs. Okay, everybody uses mugs. You've seen mugs in our slides already, but you know, there's like normal mugs that you kind of wouldn't be surprised by, and they get pretty ridiculous pretty fast. They get all shapes and sizes, all sorts of materials, right? We've got cat mugs, you know, that are completely weird shaped, you know. There's one you'll see in the slides that has udders, like it's, uh, you know. If you go to the Disney store, you're gonna come back with all kinds of weird, you know, gnome mugs and stuff like this, right? Uh, this is a small fraction of the collection we've acquired in, in our lab here. There's actually, I, I walked over to the side and I saw like eight boxes of test mugs and there's the training mugs I didn't even see, which were over somewhere else, okay. Um, but it's interesting to just stop and think for a minute, like how do I write, you know, a goal? How do I even tell the manipulation system what I need to do if I wanna do, you know, something to mugs more generally, right? Like, what is the representation that would support thinking about all of these things? I mean, it, clearly I can talk about them. I can say, you know, put your finger through the handle and that's gonna work. I could tell you and you'd do it fine, right? Um, you know, or I could even say, just set them upright, line them up. You know, those are kind of reasonable tasks to ask a, ask a manipulation system. You don't get it out of this. You know, you don't get it out of this. So we need something in the middle, right? The other canonical cate category has become shoes, right? There, you know, there's like a ridiculous, number of shoes, but uh, and diversity of shoes, like whoosh, that one was a surprise when we first grabbed that one, you know, but there's also like flip flops, right? I mean, the types of things, and the other one we discovered is that, um, you know, for a while we were running these experiments where we basically said, anybody who comes in the lab, take off your shoe. We're gonna like put it on the rack and line it up and we're gonna do a good job of it. And, People have ridiculous shoes. Like it's you know we did really well pretty fast, pretty you know, but we'd still get stumped by like a shiny Italian shoe or something, which I didn't know if my robot should be touching in the first place, you know. But uh, are there like it's the high heels, you know, are, can be impressively high, and you know we've seen them all I think at this point. But um, you know, just think for a second. How do you write a manipulation specification, let alone the implementation, that would sort of ingest that? level of, you know, it's totally reasonable to say like, I want them to be on the shoe rack in the store, you know, they should all be pointing roughly like this, you know, I could tell you that, but how do I tell my manipulation system that? Okay, and, and by the way, you know, I always have this camera in my pocket, right? I mean, I gotta do it all from this, right? So, um, you know, this is what I'm working with, is point clouds in, maybe some untold amount of data behind the scenes, uh, maybe some human annotations, that's to be determined, but I need to even specify the task. Okay, so that's the basic setup. Um, <clears throat> I mean, so, uh, you know, James was asking the other day, he said, pose feels like kind of almost too much to ask, right? For a lot of these tasks, I actually probably don't need to estimate the pose very accurately to accomplish the task, right? I mean. It's actually uh, probably there's a represent, there are representations out there that are easier than estimating the pose that would still get the job done, right? Like I don't have to have accuracy in this dimension to be able to set it down, you know, on the plane. Okay, so that's the that's the basic setup. Um, this is let's see, there's the udders right there. Look at that. Uh, who 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 gets cow udder, um, you know, mugs? Okay. But you'd like to be able to do something like, this is one of the canonical um, you know, tasks now, I guess, is just take those mugs, put them on a rack, right? And why is that a good task? That's because you know, it, is, it requires some understanding, if you will, of the mug, right? Uh, you have to understand where the handle is and the handles are all over the place. Like this handle is so different, right? Than this one or whatever, right? But somehow there's something about them that we understand 
and you have to understand it fairly well to be able to thread the, I mean, not thread the needle, but like stick the big peg through the bigger hole, much bigger hole. Um, okay, so that's a kind of an interesting balance of like a, a, a task that requires some kinematic accuracy. It actually doesn't require much dynamic understanding, which is another key thing. We'll get to more dynamic stuff later, but it's a nice, you know, I think useful skill that you might want to program. Okay, so um, there's a couple different broad approaches with it. And rather than, I mean, last time I felt like I kind of had to, um, you know, mention a bunch of things, uh, but I don't, I don't really like doing that. So I'd rather go into one or two uh, ideas a little bit um, more specifically, dig into some of the details. So I'm not gonna mention every category level representation. I'll try, well, I'll cite a few extras that we won't talk about in detail. But let me go into a few that we've thought a lot about um, that I think are representative. Um, <clears throat> so it's actually possible to, to, you know, to do a lot of this kind of thinking even in simulation. Uh, one of the nice tools about that is this, you see this um, parametric, uh, you know, there's a bunch of sp basically spline parameters here that if you move them around continuously, you get a continuous set of mugs that represented everything we found in the cabinet at, at TRI, right? And you can, in simulation, generate a huge diversity, you know, never touch the same mug twice, right? There's an infinite number of mugs there. We also would texture map um, every mug differently so that you just take your favorite images off the, off the web, slap them on there, throw them in your renderer, and you can generate a lot of data. So this is not something that's, this is not an exploration that's restricted to reality. You can do it in simulation. In fact, we have this kind of nice pipeline now um, where you can take a new mug in, scan it super fast, take an image, any image off the web or whatever, and very quickly generate a new uh, simulation asset for mugs of some, some quality. If you, you know, <clears throat> it's interesting to just say, you know, the, the path from a, a mug on the table to a mug in simulation, um, it's still hard to go all the way to like, so there's different things you might want to get right. You might want to get the physical properties right. You might want to get the rendering properties right. Um, getting a quick asset that you can like manipulate is actually not that hard anymore. We have really nice 3D scanners effectively. We can take pictures, we can stop, do texture maps. But if you want to get the material properties of, you know, this is a super shiny mug for some reason, right? And this one's completely matte over here, right? So um, that's hard. Nerf is, is looking exciting. There, there, are, there are ideas out there that make it look like we're getting better at it, that's, but that's still hard. And even the physical properties, like the, the frictional properties, the inertias, you know, we, have, we have some capabilities for that, but we don't really have mature pipelines to go from this pile of junk into sim yet. It's a, it's a good standing challenge. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, you know, an example of the task of you know, take the shoes, any shoe, and uh, just put it on the rack, right? So that's a, a different task that we looked at. Um, Shen, in particular, was in the group at the time, and she had all kinds of uh, small, cute shoes that were hard to grab. Uh, you know, there's some high heels that came in there. That was from, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the first idea that we'll talk about, right? I listed two. Um, one of them is gonna be based on key points, and to some extent, that was an example that was suggested last time, I think, uh, you know, the way Charles proposed, maybe we think about even pose estimation might be through finding uh, key points. But I wanna talk through why that could be a good idea and solve, you know, something on this spectrum. It's not gonna be only key points. If you, you know, if you just knew where a few key points were on the object, you might not be able to grab it. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna say key points plus plus. Okay, so <coughs> what do I mean by key points. Some of you know this well, but um, you know, there was a thing that happened in the computer vision world. It was motivated initially by human pose estimation. Okay, so if you've seen the videos of people dancing and they're being tracked amazingly well by a neural network, right? Um, you know, that, was a, that is a thing that has a, a capability that has gotten better and better. I mean, open pose was the first one in 2014, I believe, um, around then, like pretty early in the the revolution, and they've just gotten increasingly impressive, where you can see, you know, gymnasts that are basically folding themselves in half, but it's tracking them fairly well. 
and they can be made to work for, um, you know, for household object types, you know, different categories, not just humans. But the original push, and actually a lot of the architectures and uh, even notation in the open source codes all have some like, you know, they're sort of, you could tell that the code base started working only for humans. Um, okay, but the basic notion is that you'd like to have some, I mean, you can just attach them directly to the object, but some um, points that are identified, right? They need not to be, um, they, they, you know, if you have enough of them, they probably are sufficient to estimate the pose uh, for any one instance, but they are different than a pose estimation because if I wanna say maybe there's a, a key point for the, you know, back left leg of the table, and, or the chair, sorry, and I've got a bunch of different chairs, right? And I can sort of put a consistent key point across the category. Right, so while the distance, possibly even the, the relative positions, you know, uh, of the green key point versus the red key point or something like this, you know, this is not a rigid transformation between, different, uh, between the different objects, uh, but it can be a consistent representation of a diversity of objects. Right, for the mugs, we chose to put one on the bottom of the mug, which is interesting because you don't even have to see necessarily the key point where you, where you want to put it, okay, but we wanted to put something in the bottom so that we could set it down, something in the handle so we could grab it, something in the top, not that we ever poured anything into it, but we at least want to know which way's up, right? For the shoes, we picked, you know, the, the toe, the heel, the top. This one was very different than these, you know, tops in the tongue, you know, but uh, just a few key points actually tell you a lot about the object and they can morph across the category, but still be a consistent representation, okay? So that's why it lives sort of in this nice category level space is that that representation is, is more flexible. Okay. What's interesting and still I think it's, um, it's, there's a lot of things you can do with this representation, right? So I said to some extent the representation we need is, you know, we need it to be sufficient um, to specify tasks, right? Right, so certainly a pose and a CAD model is sufficient to specify a task. I said this is limiting in terms of specifying a task. But it turns out if you just label a handful of points and allow them to shift along the category, there's still a lot of pretty useful things you can do, like the ones I showed you. Put the, the shoe on the rack, put the mug on the, on the rack, okay? In particular, um, you know, if you assume that the objects are nearly rigid, for instance, right, and I assume that I can, when I grab the objects, the key points, wherever they may be, they are in a very different relative location on that mug versus this mug, but when I start moving them, they, stay, they go through only rigid transformations, then I can write pretty, you know, I can almost, I can just turn it into an inverse kinematics problem I can do all of my original thinking that we've already done in the kinematics parts of the, of the lectures, okay, uh, to do, to talk about, you know, relative transformations of mugs. Maybe I can, I could put a constraint saying the, the point on the bottom of the mug must be on the table, right? The handle must be to the right. You know, these are things that you can write directly as kinematic constraints, throw it into your optimization problem uh, and solve for, uh, across a category of objects. So um, like label fusion, uh, which we had talked about using ICP, you can, um, <clears throat> you know, there are different ways to get key points. We'll talk a little bit in a minute about self-supervised key points where you just try to have um, the perception system discover key points, meaningful key points by itself. But I actually think there's a lot of value in um, human labeled key points because at some point, there's some information that the geometry doesn't give you, right? Um, there's some semantic information about the object, you know, the fact that this is a handle. The word, do people know the word affordance? Yeah. From psychology, I guess, Gibsonian, right? I think it's, uh, you know, the, this notion of, um, you know, the, the handle is something that I can uh, affect change with or something. It, you know, it, 
the, the definition of the, um, the properties of the object that I care about are the things that afford me the ability to change something about the object or the world, okay? And you can't get that, I think, out of a, easily out of a self-supervised pipeline unless you're trying to go all the way to, uh, you know, an end-to-end -end task, maybe a deep reinforcement learning. But just looking at the geometry, it's hard. So we started off by saying, uh, let's hand design the notion of like the toe key point, the heel key point, the tongue, the, you know, the back of the, the opening, okay? And use our same kind of tricks to make a GUI that would allow you to uh, quickly label lots of key points and generate a big data set, okay? So this is, um, <coughs> it was important to us to, to have, you know, no uh, requirement on CAD models. So that is a shoe that was just scanned by the robot doing its quick thing with a depth sensor and doing one of these dense reconstructions just on the point cloud. So that's a mesh that came out right out of a, a, a point cloud that was fused together by multiple views on the robot, okay? And that was enough to throw it in the GUI, you know, click a few times and you can label uh, lots of images. Okay, so, um, I wanna dig in a little bit to the details and I'll go through a couple examples here. So um, it's interesting to think about uh, how do you actually set up this key point um, detection algorithm, right? And how do you train a key point detector? Okay, so um, you know the first question is, you know, how do we formulate the problem here? Let me impose that we're going to start from a, an image coming in. And let's start off with the simpler maybe form where we just have an RGB image coming in. This has got, it's just, you know, my width times height times RGB coming in. And I'm going to put it into a big deep network. You can talk, about, I won't talk in detail about the architectures, but there's a bunch of canonical architectures for key point detection uh, I can mention. And again, the question, first question is, what representation should we put out? Right? What do you think? What's the natural representation to put out? Yeah, totally, right? I mean, you should just put, potentially X, well, let's even, like you said, it's easier to think first about just 2D key points. You can potentially project them back into 3D later, but yeah, so maybe if I have um, a handful of them that I wanna spit out, you know, I can, one for each of the, of the key points, you'd think I could just put the XY position out, right? And open pose, I believe, did this. Certainly the early key point networks definitely did this, okay? But people don't do that anymore, <laughs> right? Um, and I, you know, it's, I, for me, it's somewhere between a, like, um, I think we can generalize it. We can think about uncertainty distributions and the like. Um, it, there's also something about, you know, what neural networks like to do uh, that, that's hiding in there, right? Which is frustrating that um, I think we don't, I, you know, I think we don't as a field completely understand what works and what doesn't work. Um, and people have found that other representations can work better for a key point estimation. Um, do people know what the, the more common one these days is? Some, I know someone knows. Yeah, so um, so you could say like maybe I would just draw in the 2D image the locations of the points. Um, that is that is close to what it is, but what they end up doing is for each, um, you know, for key point I, right, we actually put out a 2D heat map. 
So um, the desired image, if, you, um, if you're making training data from, from this or from something else, would be um, actually an, an image that basically is drawn as a, a probability distribution, rendered as an image, if you will, where the pixel value i is the, let's say, the probability that the point is at this um, that key point at x, y. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so you see these little Gaussian heat maps that, um, that, the, that people will render as the output of the, um, you know, of the neural network, an entire image for each distinct key point. It is meant, I think it is, it is satisfying to think of it as, you know, trying to represent the uncertainty of your key point estimator. Like that is a very satisfying explanation for why this would work. But it still feels a little, like there's no real notion of people taking that to fruition, right? It's kind of like, I think the recipe right now is um, try a few covariances until you find one that works well. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the of official recipe I hear from people who do it, do it a lot, right? And, uh, you know, I think people don't tend to use, they, they, they tend to say that the desired image is this entire probability map. Um, they don't tend to use, like, maximum likelihood or other sort of losses that might, um, might account for more interesting uncertainty distributions. It's really almost, it feels to me, um, almost a trick to just, you know, it's a neural networks like the output image, I images in to images out, so let's, let's, let's write it like that. And these can be, you can make these smooth loss functions um, by, depending on how you infer the, the, true, um, the true key point location from the uh, rendered image. You know, if you take the expected value of this distribution, then that's a smooth function, which people do in uh, the integral posed networks, okay? Okay, so for every one of these, um, we take a, uh, you know, a 2D heat map coming out. Yeah? Just to clarify, is this the difference between the possible category and the entire neural network, or is the idea that this is a category? So the question is, is this for a single category or for m many categories? So I think this, the, the sweet spot seems to be for a single category, we're going to learn one set of representations. If you wanted to manipulate multiple categories simultaneously, I would... Think of it as a separate set of networks, yeah. Um, and how you define category is ambiguous. I gave you two examples, but you know, um, is your system going to perform better if I call that a boot and distinguish it from the flip-flop and the other ones? You know, for some tasks, yes, right. So I think the notion of a category is very vague at this point. But um, you know, I think it depends on your task. Okay, so a reasonable loss function here would be like a heat map regression loss people use. What do I mean by that? I mean the output of my network is an entire image and I will use the L2 distance between that image and the desired image which is a hallucinated heat map with a small Gaussian you know, um, basically neural network out, you know, let me call it neural network of the image minus um, hallucinated heat map with a Gaussian at the ground, at the, um, labeled point. Okay, and that seems to work fairly well. I mean, people have different ways exactly to train it. The um, people watch, but so you said, um, do I mean taking a Gaussian blurring kernel and, you know, on the, the sort of, if I made a zero one image, right, and then I did a Gaussian kernel, I would get effectively a, re a rendered image that looked like I, if I printed a Gaussian, right? Yeah, so I think yes to both of them. <laughs> 
So uh, again, there are modifiers to this that I think can make a big difference in practice. The ones we used in our work were from the integral uh, pose machine line, which did have uh, one other term there, but you know, conceptually this is, the, I think, the workhorse. Okay, so a couple nice points to make. Um, you know, just at, so depending on how you generate the training data, whether it's synthetic uh, training data or human labels through a, a GUI like this, right? So I, I made some of these points before, but the fact that it is, it is a fundamentally different representation than pose, it has interesting properties like um, I can put a key point, you know, that I'm predicting right in the sm smack in the middle of the handle of the mug. It doesn't have to actually be geometrically connected to the mug, right? It's somehow in affordance of the mug that I, uh, that I have semantically labeled, but, um, you know, by, by a human annotation, but it need not be actually part of the mug. It could be the top of the mug in the, in the free space here, right? Um, you could have them be, uh, very sparse, you could have them be more dense, right? And they're good for different things depending on, on how sparse or dense they are. But there's a lot of subtleties, I think, about how this works through. And I thought the place where I've seen, um, you know, the, the subtleties pop up in sort of the simplest to reason about um, fashion, we did this sort of thought experiment. Greg was doing this thought experiment with Maggie Wang um, of just what would it look like to use key points um, as, a, as a way to, to reason about boxes. I think he had a bunch of boxes in his, uh, in his apartment during COVID and was inspired to, you know, he was pointing his depth camera at the box, piles of boxes and asking like, you know, uh, could I estimate shapes and pose and everything of boxes given, uh, you know, given a key point type, type network. So let's just work through that, um, that as an example. The boxes he, uh, the, the key points that he identified here on the, on the board or in the picture, right? He put one, some yellow boxes at each of the corners. Maybe he put a, you want to know where the label is or something like that. Seems like a totally reasonable thing to output um, from the network, okay? But it starts to get into some, some subtleties, okay? So first question is, um, you know, how many key points do we want per box? An important question. It seems there's only a couple of sort of, well, sorry, it, it gets subtle if you start thinking about it. How many, so let me ask you, how many key points do we want per box? You say three, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So um, let's say I just want to, uh, yeah, move them to the next, you know, to, I'm gonna pile the boxes over here to the pile of the boxes over here. Maybe I wanna do a, you know, pack a trailer or something like that. That's something a lot of people wanna do. Uh, what do you think? Other answers besides three. So let me, let me ask you why you say three first. I can, I. Right, so from, um, from three we can, we can get the height, the depth, you know, maybe we need four to get the width also? Um, yeah. Maybe maybe four, right? So if I were to just get, you know, those four. But, but what if, how do I know that they're those four, right? And what if I'm looking at it straight on from the side or something like that, right? Maybe, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you could try to predict all eight and maybe, maybe that would give you some robustness even, right? If it's, if it's already just to you know, think of it as a more robust version of the four point, key point thing and, uh, and yeah, for, for consistent tracking, right? So these are, you know, these are good questions, good examples. Right, that, so that is a key, uh, key point. I can't believe I was about to say that. <laughs> uh, 
I just, that was like just association, not uh, humor. So, um, right, so, so he said, it, it is an important thing to observe, which is that the orientation at which you're viewing the box, it might have a different number of key points available. Also, you can see there's an occlusion, on, you know, if, you're, if your box are piled up, it might cover up some of your corners, right? So occlusions are also a reason why you might, your key points might appear or disappear. Okay, so are the key points unique? I think this is, a, this is an important decision that one has to make when they're training a perception system, right? Do you expect to have, um, if I were to rotate the box by 180 degrees, and let's say I, I, you said the tracking example, which is a good example, but what if I wasn't tracking? I just showed two images with no context connecting the two of this box and this box rotated 180 degrees. Should I try to train you know, something that is uh, canonical you know, orientation of the box and maybe the only signal I have there is just like where the label is or there's a few small asymmetries. You know, most things are asymmetric a little bit. Maybe the mugs aren't so much. Or do I try to have something that is, you know, in whatever orientation gives the sort of canonical key point locations? Right? There's no right answer to any of these, really. There, these are, it depends on the task, I think, is actually the right, um, the truth. But, but they get subtle pretty fast about the choices you make there. I like eight myself. That's what I've always advocated for eight. But I wish it was as simple as that. Because what if the box is, you know, if my... Uh, my picture of the box, you know, part of it's a little bit off the screen, right? You know, I, I think occlusions are, are something that we can potentially deal with. Um, you know, you can actually estimate occluded key points You know, in, synth in synthetic data, it's very easy to label the location of the key points, even if they're occluded. There's nothing that would stop my simulation from putting X, Y locations, even the ones that are behind another box. In real world data, it might be hard to label occluded key points. Okay. But yeah, even if it's not occlusions, if it's just clipping or partial view or whatever, there might be reasons why you shouldn't expect to get exactly eight every time. Right, so you have to have some sort of estimation pipeline that's okay with getting eight, uh, but doesn't demand getting eight. Right? I wish, because things would get easier if it was if it, you could demand getting eight. Right? The symmetries I think are an important issue. Right? Do you uh, do you try to make us you know? A representation that allows for the symmetries, you know, in, in which case, how do you generate that synthetic data carefully, right? Um, or not, you know, these all come up. Okay, so um, how would we, you know, how would we output a system that didn't have, you know, what would be the output of my network for a system that, um, you know, didn't try to identify any of the symmetries or anything like that. I mean, to some extent, this image is kind of an example of that, right? If I were to just draw a heat map that really just had a Gaussian in all the places I thought I had, you know, a single heat map, I could say these are the, the places where I have my Gaussians, and the desired image is to put a dot in every one of those. That would be a representation that would allow you to say, I don't care about which corner it is. They're all the same. And I want to you know, generate a bunch of training data that would just find all the key corner key points, right? And possibly the occluded corner key points, too. I could have the ones in the back, right? Say it again. So the question is, you know, do, do you need to be able to identify the same box reliably from frame to frame, let's say, right? I think, um, you know, in a lot of these cases, that's not the stated requirement in the category level. It would be just, given I have some instances in front of me, be able to reason them about them as one of the family of boxes. I think you can use object detection on top of this to do, you know, um, labels of particular boxes, right? If you want to have your, the shoe boxes different than the whatever, and that could, I would think the object detection pipeline would help you more with that. 
right? It, maybe if the, ge if the size was a, st a strong indicator and you could estimate the size more explicitly with this, maybe that would help. But oftentimes I would just think of the, the perception front end, uh, you know, the object detection front end. Okay. Um, so this would be, you know, all corners are the same. If I trained, you know, like the bottom left corner, the top right corner defined maybe in my camera frame, for instance, or something like that, and I trained each of those as being somehow a different Gaussian, right, then I could try to learn a more uh, orientation specific representation, okay? And these are all possible. And I think the, you know, the heat map regression loss would support any of those. The, some of the other losses people use where you would, are kind of baking in the assumption that you have only one Gaussian and you try to do, you try to find the peak of that Gaussian. Right? The expected value uh, interpolations in the integral pose machine would not do well on this kind of representation. There is an important point. So if you have multiple instances, then how do you deal with that? This gets a little bit to, to your point. How do you deal with multiple instances? That's really what people do. So she says, do instant segmentation at the same time. It is, to me, a, a major success story that, you know, that mask RCNN pipeline just works so well that almost every other downstream perception task says, step one, you know, get my crop around a, a particular object and only worry about finding a single instance inside that crop, right? So. So typically you take the bounding box approximation out of something like a you know, mask RCNN and just apply this, these algorithms directly inside that tighter bounding box, right? You could still get, you know, this is a, a pretty tight bounding box already and you, you have corners from other places, but you can say in this bounding box, I expect to find eight or less, you know, if it's, if it's going off to the side. Yeah, so I, I don't claim, I'm not trying to claim this is the state of the art box detection. I, I'm using it as a thought experiment for key points more than that. But um, so I, you know, I think I will show later a different, I, I was gonna use this as, a, as the example for both um, this and the dense descriptors, which would be a little bit, it's gonna show you, you can pretty reliably get the, um, the centers of the box too. Yeah, absolutely. But um, you know, the, the corners are appealing, I think in the sense that if you wanted to estimate the shape of the box and that had some canonical values, then that might be the signal you most want, right? There's another interesting step, which I think connects back to, um, to what we've already learned in the class, right? So if I do have estimates in, let's say, 2D of uh, my eight key points, then how do, I, how do I get that back to something like a shape and a pose, okay? So somehow, uh, people want to do 3D key points, probably. So you can try to make a heat map in 3D. That's a standard <laughs> approach, right? So think of it as a, you know, a voxelized, you know, so you have images at each possible depth and you really put a, your Gaussian desired kernel, you know, a heat map in that big object, in that big uh, space. I mean, I, like I said, it, it's shocking to me how many outputs people put on the, on the output of a network, right? I mean, it seems hopelessly inefficient to do that, but it works and that we have hardware to support, right? A lot of people will do something like 2D key points 
plus depth per pixel. So you'd have just uh, you'd have the heat map for the two uh, D key points, and then you'd have one extra channel which says the I, at every pixel I think the depth is some number. Okay, and that is I think justified like this um, you know monocular stereo kind of uh, workflow I, I mentioned to you before. Okay, and there's a handful of you know some people will try to take two um, D key points. projected onto a point cloud, right? Projected onto a depth measurement. That's not gonna work for occluded key points, but at least for the key points you can see, if you have a depth image, it might be enough to just do a 2D, um, 2D key points and then project directly onto the depth which is kind of, you could imagine this being the attempt to learn roughly that. If you can get 3D key point estimates out, right, then you can imagine trying to estimate the shape and the pose using basically the middle of our ICP step, right, that pose, uh, the pose regression, that it's an SVD problem when you have, you know, known correspondences, you know, and uh, and you're only and you're trying to estimate, uh, you know, a given rigid rotation, it's actually easier in some sense where it has less constraints. If you're allowed yourself your box to shrink and stretch, then that is actually taking away some of the constraints on the uh, on the transform. So it's actually an easier problem. But that pipeline. Uh, can work well. Imagine doing, you know, ICP that's allowed to stretch and shrink in order to go from the key point coming out of your heat map into an estimation of this box's shape and relative pose. So that whole workflow can can work pretty well. Um, right. So this is how Greg played it out. It played out for Greg and Maggie. Um, those are rendered images, right? So. This is just rendered boxes. He took some texture maps of boxes off the, of Amazon boxes off the web or something. I think the way, um, I remember, you know, I, I was standing with Greg, I'm like, is that one rendered or real? You know, I'd always ask him, and, and the way, he, the tell is the background. Like he, you know, he wasn't like upside down in the forest when he, when he had those boxes. So that's probably a rendered, uh, you know, it's a blender rendered image or something like that, okay? But they look really good. They can look really, really good. Okay, so you generate all your procedural training data. Okay, um, you can train your mask RCNN front end with a um, perfect, you know, image pixel-wise uh, labels, right, for the instant segmentation, and then you can start um, making, you know, your synthetic desired key points, either occluded or not. Actually, generating the unoccluded key points is harder from in simulation, right? Uh, but then you generate a bunch of ground truth data. The performance in synthetic images, again, like random person sideways in the background is an indication that that was a blender image, okay, but um, in, real, in real world data, it transfers surprisingly well, or, or not surprising anymore, but you get these beautiful instance um, crops from the real data, right? And uh, you can get pretty good predicted key points with just the standard machinery pushed through that. Okay. I do think that, you know, the subtleties of this, I, you know, I, I don't know that I don't know that we know the right answer. We, this was kind of a, a, pro, a something we did for fun, but haven't taken all the way to fruition yet of um, how exactly we want to, um, you know, what's the best way to to represent these 3D key points. And I think it's driven partly, I think, by how you'd want to reconstruct and like you say, what the task is, exactly what the, um, you know. I think my preference has been for occluded key points, hoping for eight of them, a strong ICP type loss to reconstruct, which means we need our heat map in 3D. But who knows if that's the best. Questions on that? <laughs> 
I can see how that's more than pose, right? It's more than pose even for boxes where there's not a lot more semantic information available. It still allows you to do things of boxes of all sizes, right? Okay, so for manipulation of, you know, more interesting things where we've labeled just a handful of key points, um, I think the key points alone are not enough. That's what I meant when I wrote key points plus plus over there, right? Um, they are often enough to specify the task, right? So say, I want these key points to move through this rigid transform over to this location. That's a nice way to specify the task. But if you actually want to grab the mug, then you need a little bit more. Um, but it seems, so uh, we felt that there's a lot of interesting manipulation tasks that you can do with sort of an online geometry estimation of the geometry of the mug, the task specified in terms of key points, and then you do basically your antipodal. You can do something fancier um, in there, but you can, you know, if you just reason about the point cloud and you have the crop from the instance segmentation, then that's enough, you know, the sort of the local instantaneous point cloud, maybe with a little bit of reconstruction, um, plus this idea that once I grab the object, it stays rigid in my hand and moves through the same rigid transforms was enough to program a pretty interesting, broader amount of tasks than we could do with the um, pose-based known uh, object pipeline. Does that make sense? Right, so we have manipulated lots of shoes and lots of mugs, um, you know, just to say it's statistically strong. Uh, <clears throat> So what are the limitations of that? Simple, that's just one recommendation of a, of a pipeline, okay? Um, one of the things that it struggles with, if I, if I only use the instantaneous point cloud that I'm getting, then I don't have any sense of what's the back of the object, right? So if I wanted to grasp something that involved me picking up the back of the object, or if I'm moving it through space and I wanted to avoid, avoid collisions, you know, if I pretended that my mug was only the front side that I could see, then I'm gonna bash things in, you know, as I, as I move through the world, right? But, you know, neural networks are good at predicting hard things. Uh, shape completion is a thing, right? You can make shape completion networks that will hallucinate the back of an object. A lot of the, the tools we use in manipulation do this implicitly, but you can do it explicitly by just trying to have, a, training a different network to take a partial view and hallucinate the backside, for instance. And, uh, and if you put that into this pipeline, you can do even more. You can do like collision avoidance constraints as you move through the world at a class general level. And we'll talk more about force control later, but I was just very surprised when uh, Wei Gao, who was uh, working on this, um, showed that with that basically that same pipeline, you know, just knowing where key points were, he could do a lot of tasks that seemed, uh, see, would have seemed to require more information. So like peg and hole type tasks or force-based tasks. And basically, um, for those of you that know impedance control, and we hopefully you all will in a few lectures, um, you know, basically you just, uh, if I wanted to apply an impedance on, uh, for between the mug and the world, if I grab the mug in my hand and I just start regulating the impedance down here, then I can do a lot of interesting tasks, okay? So uh, just to say that this pipeline supports, you know, relatively advanced things. Um, I'll show you a couple of fun examples. You know, peg and hole type stuff erasing with arbitrary erasers, right? Like to have a, uh, you know, a reasonable eraser, you know, that means some sort of force control type, type task, but how do you do force control if you don't even know the geometry of the thing you're controlling through? Well, you put a key point at the, at the bottom, you regulate the force at the end of the key point, then you can do sort of a category level um, force control type task. Peg and hole kind of tasks work surprisingly well. It's plugging in USB cables, putting Legos together, big Legos admittedly, but uh, yeah, plugging things into the USB charger. And it's, you know, it's, it's mostly a question of what tasks are sufficient, can be sufficiently specified and where this sort of very simple um, representation of the object is somehow sufficient, okay? And for tasks like this, knowing where the end of the USB thing is once it's in your hand is most of what you need to know, right? 
Does that make sense? So key points better than proposed, I think. To the point, so I mean, here's what happens is you have a team that's working on perception, you have a team that's working on planning and control, you know, you agree early on that the message you're gonna send me from your perception system is like the pose of the object or whatever, and then I'm gonna build my whole planning and control stack around pose, right? And then and I've got my sort of that state estimation stack around pose, and I've got my simulation stack around pose. And then someone says, oh, you know what? Pose is a really a bad thing for us to estimate from perception. And then it takes a very long time to sort of go through and make all of the systems stop thinking about pose because it's so baked into everything we do. Um, so if you're starting up and you haven't already baked it in, just don't, like you start typing pose, you know, whatever, just like say, wait a second, not in my message, and not, you know, not in the API. Those things should not communicate with pose. It's restrictive. <clears throat> okay, so that pipeline, I think um, it, it is, it, you know, we'll talk about its limitations. It's very geometric, right? It's, it does have the ability to capture the semantics because it had human labels, right? Um, so the question really, I think, is can you do similar things to that but get rid of the human labels? What kind of tasks can you enable without that semantic level of uh, labeling, right? Um, can we do some of this self-supervision kind of work uh, in, in this representation? So people have taken you know, um, key point type representations and done you know, tool use. That's uh, I know something that uh, your TAs work on. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there's hammering tasks and other tasks. So, so it, it does, I think, extend potentially. But at some point, it is a limited representation. <clears throat> um, so let me tell you about the, uh, you know, a generalization of that, which is another, I think, proposal for a category level object representation, which goes through dense correspondences. And uh, the version we did was called dense object nets, okay? Um, but the, like, the core technology was done before, you know, not specific to manipulation, but was done uh, by Tanner Schmidt and Richard Newcomb and Dieter Fox, for instance. Okay, so here's the basic uh, plot that you have to understand to, to get the gist of this. Okay, so this is a new camera image of a hat. Okay, this is a real-time um, you know, observations of the hat. Okay, uh, Pete, I believe in this particular case, uh, had his mouse over the left image at this part of the hat. Okay, and the correspondence problem you know well, the correspondence problem would be given two very different images of the hat, try to find the, cl the, the same point in the other image of the hat, okay? So let me just start from the beginning. So there's some at the beginning here, right? This is the proposed, you know, this is what the network is predicting is the same point in the hat, and it's getting it in very different um, you know, orientations, whatever, the hat is deformed completely, but it's still, giving reliable representations of what's the same point of the hat. And in the middle, we have the same heat point, heat map kind of uh, rendering of, of the, um, the output of the network, okay, which is saying, you know, what is it scoring all of the different possible points in the image as being potentially the best correspondence. All right, so let me tell you how this, is, this works. I think it's another good example of, of these kind of representations. Okay, um, I mean the basic pipe, let me even just show you the pipeline first, right? So the basic pipeline is again this 3D reconstruction. So you put a brand new object, that's another thing. So, you know, we have shoes, we have mugs, we have a lot of baby toys around lab too, which is kind of a hard to explain to, you know, fiscal, right? Um, but yeah, but it's good for robots, I think. So, so, you know, soft plush toys with like buckles and zippers and stuff are like great for robots. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so you got a baby toy, you put it on your table, you do your dense um, reconstruction, right? So this is um, something that I, th I think in a future term deserves a lecture on just dense reconstruction. It's you know, basically um, simultaneous localization for manipulation, but you know, we, we've said over and over again that you have this ability to fuse point clouds into a consistent representation uh, using sign distance functions and you get these beautiful um, meshes out just by scanning with your 3D scanner, okay? So that, um, as an intermediate signal, allows you to train this, this representation, which is these dense descriptors, okay? So how do I train dense descriptors? 
formulation here is I'm going to take an image in. Again, it'll be my RGB image, width, height, I3. I'm going to pour it into my neural network. You could call it your latent representation or intermediate representation or whatever you want to think of it as, but I'm going to project the, the pixels in the image into some descriptor space. Okay? And the thing you get out when you do that is um, hopefully, not that, but yeah, that's too bad. You get uh, nice colorful images. We'll see different examples, but you'll see, um, you know, if you, if you choose D to be three, then you can actually just render it again as an RGB image. And what you'd like to see is somehow that if I show many different poses of the uh, object, right, that it will, it will have a consistent, you know, the same color will be associated with the same parts of the objects as I move it through many different uh, lighting conditions, many different poses, many different deformations and stuff like that, okay? So it's just some intermediate latent representation that should be better than working with RGB, right? Um, we're gonna put it into some descriptor space, some light pose invariant space, okay? And the way that we train them is with a, a pixel-wise contrastive loss, okay? So um, we train this by putting in image A, image B, it's a Siamese training, okay? You get two dense descriptor images out, okay? But you do, you have a data set already where you've taken many images of the same uh, object, you've done your dense reconstruction, okay? And now you can go back and say, in this image, right? This pixel should be the same as in this image, you know, some other pixel. So you have matching pixels just based on your 3D reconstruction. Okay, so from here, we have just descriptor images, a and B, okay, and then we have a list of matches from 3D reconstruction. And we also just make a bunch of um, non-matches. So basically for every one match, um, you know, that we have in our data set, we'll, we'll throw in a bunch of non-matches like, oh, I think 150 is the default number. Is 150 non-matches roughly for every one match, okay? And it's to the point where, you know, our, our lost function has, has got like, I think order of a, a, you know, a million samples per image, uh, you know, per, per image pair. So we're just pumping through a pretty dense version of these two images, milking them for everything that we can to write a lot of different, um, uh, you know, a, a rich objective function for this, okay? And then we'd write a, a loss function, which basically looks like this, right? So the loss of the matches is like one over the number of matches of the, you know, you want those two to be the same. So I'll, I'll say the neural network of image A um, at the match image minus the neural network function at the image B at the whatever the match pixel should be at B, that whole thing squared, okay? And then you have uh, some negative uh, uh, score for non-matches, which you can write in a bunch of different ways, but the way in practice it gets uh, it was done in that work was the non-matches and <clears throat> the idea is to only penalize you want to sort of saturate your penalization so you don't want if they're too close to the same point um, that's okay but you want to sort of let me just write it and I'm going to do max of zero and some threshold minus the neural network scores okay so i'm gonna i want these things to be different so i'm gonna penalize now if they're similar okay um, but i'm only gonna penalize um, if they're beyond some threshold i want to rule out nearby points 
and you basically add these two objectives together uh, to get this pixel-wise contrastive loss. Okay, so that's it. Find some in intermediate representation so that two views are the same, you know, they get the same value in, in this D space uh, when the pixels should be the same and a different value when, they're, um, when they should be different, okay? And it works surprisingly well, okay? So you get these, um, you know, you, you can get potentially very sharp. This was an old version, this is a new version. I've got the, you know, Pete's mouse or whatever moving, maybe Lucas's mouse moving over um, the object here and you can get very sharp, you know, responses to pretty non-trivial objects. And they're arbitrary objects. Okay, so, yeah. Are you saying the network continues to be fast, or are you using a type from memory? They almost always ResNet uh, backbones and stuff like this, yeah. Yeah, yeah big ResNet uh, backbone. Uh, Sorry, the, the question was, were we training from scratch? And the answer is almost always no. Yeah, we generate, you know, again, it's sort of like your point last time, we generate a lot of data, but in a pretty narrow band, right? We do try to do things like uh, lighting changes and um, getting lots of different poses of the same object and, you know, deform it if it's, gonna, if it's deformable and stuff like that, but it's still very narrow compared to ImageNet, right? So this is the this is the um, the mystical, magical, and ab, and ad hoc, I'd say maybe thing. Okay, so um, we can do either class general, uh, you know, class general objects. We're looking see this, these are the kind of images I was talking about. This is just if you choose D to be three and you render it as RGB, these are different shoes, but they all light up the same colors in the same places on the shoes. Okay. So how did you train that? Uh, so, so that was uh, the case where you trained each shoe independently. So each shoe was scanned independently and just something like out of the capacity of the network or something, it chose to reuse the same D value. It didn't have any incentive to use or, or not use the same values, but it, found it tends to find representations where it uses the same color values for the same parts of the shoes. So it is explicitly for any one view of the object saying that these things are distinct. Every point, in whatever pose you're, you're scanning or whatever, it's saying every point is distinct, right? So if you had repeated buckles or whatever like that, those are distinct in this. There's a canonical frame where I'm gonna say, you know, where I am in that frame gets a distinct descriptor. That's the objective explicitly. It doesn't try to find repeated structure inside it, okay? What's interesting is that if you train them, like this, in this example, right, we train different hats at different times. So if you actually train all of the same, all, if you put multiple hats in the test data at the same time, then it will distinguish, it'll learn a different, it must learn a different representation for each hat, right? So it'll, it'll actually learn an instance specific. All you have to do is throw multiple hats in at the same scan. If you train one hat at a time, then it somehow, with this is unfortunately black magic, it somehow chooses to use the same representation for the same parts of the object and you get these class general descriptors out. Yeah. So would that probably be better to test them so that you have a black magic signal? It's impressively good. Yeah. I mean, you want your training data to include those sort of deformations, but if it does, it's, it's impressively good. Yeah. So, um, you know, that is a pretty, so that's a completely self super, I didn't have to, anybody had, nobody had to go in and label anything, right? Um, and it was, it was, so you could think of it as just having very dense but self supervised key points, which is super useful. It doesn't give me the language to say, you know, hang the handle on the rack, right? There's nothing, I haven't attached enough semantics to do some of those richer specifications, but it's sort of, you know, just sufficient to specify some tasks. And so it lives somewhere else in this, 
uh, in that spectrum of like, you know, what can I specify? Right, so for instance, if you just wanted to say, pick up the object from the tail, right, the caterpillar from the tail, then clicking in the dense descriptor image says, you know, I want you to grab at this descriptor value. And that's enough to partly to specify a pick task relative to the points of the object. Did you have a question? Yeah. But the, 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 the robot is doing all the data collection for itself. There's an algorithm which does this dense reconstruction, and it's just, you just go through that um, list of data and point, you know, saying this point projected back. You know, all that data is constructed automatically. No human touching it. So there's some tasks you can do with that representation alone, right? Yeah. Good. So, so it's, it's doing significant scanning when it's learning the dense descriptors. Even when it's picking, you can get a, you, we're doing reconstruction so you can just, you don't have to. If you, if you had a partial view and you did the dense descriptor and you went and grabbed, you'd be able to do something. But if you want to like, you know, have a less uh, partial views, then that initial scan can make it more robust. Okay, and so yeah, this is to answer your, uh, the question about the, the centers of the boxes, right? So uh, you can totally do this for boxes and it sort of lights up and there's a canonical sort of dense descriptor frame for, for boxes too, right? And it works pretty well in reality, yeah? So you'd like to be able, so the question is, if you can do a dense reconstruction in ICP, then why are you not done, right? And the, um, the point is I'd like to, for instance, specify the task on one model of the shoe. So I'll scan one shoe and I'll say, pick it up here, and then transfer that to new shoes that I haven't seen before, right? So I want my specification and my manipulation to generalize across the category. So I agree with you, for any one instance of the shoe, we could do it, you know, do this, and then you could move the shoe. I could try to reconstruct it with ICP, but if I want the task to generalize across the shoes. I might mention them at the end, but if you have, if you know more, that uh, that's great to know too. Yeah. Yes. Good. So the question is, how do you choose D? Is there any intuition about that? Um, you know, the answer might not be super satisfying. You know, I think um, even since the first paper came out, we've had more um, more tricks that sort of make these uh, you know, that we that we use for training. They're all in the public repositories. But um, it used to be that actually we we would use three for visualization, and you could increase it, and you'd hope it would do better, but it didn't do a lot better. With a, with a normalization trick, we basically would push all the descriptors to be on the unit um, sphere. Then we did see that as you increase D, you get better and better, you know, meaning sharper receptive fields in the dense descriptors. And I think, you know, I don't know, 10 or 12 or something is probably what we, were, we would be using at the end. Um, but it is not like, you know, analyze your system, go through some procedure, decide what D is gonna be. It's really kind of, you know, maybe it's not bad. It's a, it's a model reduction in, you know, in, in classical system identification. Also, you know, even for linear system identification, you try, you try a, a number of different, or your piece, you know, principal component analysis. You kind of like see how many different modes you need to describe your data. And, and I think the, the same sort of thinking is happening here. As I increase the, the dimension of my representation, I can do more, but at some cost, I don't have enough data to fill that space. You know, it's that kind of thinking. You would like to think, given infinite data, as I increase D, I would have only sharper images. And I think the only thing pushing down on that is computation time and data time. So you find a balance. Yeah? Yeah, it's teaching me this application from different angles because I have a sense in the mind that this helps me out a lot. Um, they are projected, so it's, it's not, 
Um, it is not that the pixel 32 in this image and pixel 32 in this image. It's pixel 32 in this, this image plus whatever pixel that same thing in my 3D maps to in this other image, okay. right? So that's, you know, match A, match B, right? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. So could, could I do uh, mass properties or other um, you know, physical quantities inside the Densus script? I mean, so one thing you can definitely do is you could just take your RGB image, turn it into the descriptor dimension. I mean, really, the, 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 even in this picture, you could sort of think this is an ugly space. I turn the lights on or whatever, the same points change color values a lot, whereas this gives a very consistent um, representation. So using this as features for something like ICP totally makes sense. And then if you get in this space of like you've got features that you want to correspond masses or other things to, it could make sense. I, but I do think that the dense descriptor object by itself, um, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it becomes a useful um, quantity of the, for the object, but it's trained purely on a geometric understanding of the object, right? So in fact, that is, I'd say, the limitations of the dense descriptors is that they are completely geometric, right? So Pete used to say, what did he say? He say it won't tell you when you've done frying your egg or something like that. He, you can come up with silly examples, but um, but even we, I mean, there's other places we know that there's limitations to this, right? So if your object doesn't have a canonical pose, then there's not a right answer for the dense descriptors. So like we were playing with uh, peeling potatoes, right? We want a robot to peel potatoes, right? Um, there's no canonical pose for a potato, right? You can rotate the potato or whatever, and there's no reason that the dense descriptor should have a consistently put like at the 43rd I, it should be descriptor value, whatever. And it just doesn't work for that. It's just not a good representation for something like that or peeling carrots or anything that doesn't have a canonical reference frame. Right? You'd like to, if you can't sort of go down and say, I would put the reference frame like this, and you know, then it, it's not gonna be able to do it either. Um, it's also very just, you know, it's not going to capture anything about the dynamics, really, or, or anything like that. All right, let me just close out by um, mentioning, so these are the representations we used in the video I showed you before, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, there are a couple other really good, um, interesting object representations that this is an early version of the Knox family, um, which is normalized object coordinate space for category level 60 object pose and size estimation. Okay, so this one is more explicitly saying, take all of your CAD models, snap them into some canonical frame. We're gonna still think about poses, but poses plus the transformation, the warping from the original uh, geometry, you know, the geometry across the class into this canonical frame. And it's, I, I can't help but see dense descriptors when I look at these pictures because they're rendered in sort of the same way. But you make, you know, the, the value that you give this, it's not, a, it's not discovered by gradient descent. It's imposed as saying, you know, this, this pixel in the squished, scaled, canonical frame um, would be, you know, have color value, whatever, okay? And you can use that representation in a lot of similar ways. The Knox um, line of papers talked about doing pose estimation even by taking your canonical frame and, and basically trying to warp the images in your renderer. That, that's what analysis by synthesis is to try to estimate the pose. So this is a good, watch right here. So it's, you've got some different pose and you basically try to warp it through rendering into the canonical frame and that gives you, that estimates your rotation and translation and does pose estimation. Okay, so I didn't say much of anything about that, but Knox is like, if you think about object um, category level, object representations, Knox is one of the first ones you think about. Um, and there's just a lot of other good examples of people doing, um, for instance, um, using a kind of uh, geometry inference engine. Let me see if I can find the right pictures here in the middle. Yeah, so you get some point cloud and you try to basically fill it in with a shape completion, you know, and maybe shape is just enough to do a lot of good manipulation, right? So if you have from point cloud to shape completion to, um, you know, to writing objectives just on shape, you know, that can work pretty well too. So it's a super rich 
class of, of you know, space of what is the right level to represent uh, objects for manipulation. I'll say again, I think it's mostly about how do you specify the task. Right? That's what that defines these things. And these are insufficient for the tasks I love most that have more dynamics. If I wanted to tie the laces on those shoes, it's probably gonna fall short. Uh, we've tried a little bit. Um, you know, so, uh, but I hope you guys can all be contributing. I think this is an active area of research. Good. That was part two. Uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Yeah, we're sorry that the piece that's not released. It's going to be released as soon as I get back to my computer. <laughs> so.